Spirit, that we may always look forward to the end of this present evil age, to the day of your righteous judgment. Keep us steadfast in true and living faith, and present us at last holy and blameless before you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from the prophet Daniel, chapter 7. And it's striking just how similar in the Old Testament the book of Daniel is to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Daniel is also given these visions for us to see, visions of the end. And this particular one, just two short verses, is a vision of that day of judgment. Daniel saw. As I looked... Thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated. And the books were opened. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel of our Lord from Matthew chapter 25. And Jesus too teaches us about that day in the form of a parable. Uh, and the, the, uh, the cultural setting of this account maybe sounds a bit strange to us, a bit confusing. But his point is very clear. Uh, in the foolishness of our sinful nature, uh, we think we can go unprepared. Jesus teaches us otherwise. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil and jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and turned their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. Virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the doors were shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated, and we will sing a hymn of praise uh, directly related to the words that we just heard. We'll sing uh, like three verses here. Pray God, what do I see in here?
Revelation chapter 22 uh, in our series of Vision of the End. This is the very last chapter of God's Word. In fact, it goes to the very last words of God's Word. And we see in this vision, uh, this is Jesus speaking. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of the scroll. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in the scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this scroll. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, your friends in Christ. A reward and a warning. Those two things very much go hand in hand, a reward and a warning. I've learned that firsthand in raising small children. That's how it goes. A reward, this is what you'll get, and a warning, that is, if you do this or, or don't do that. And I can now see, looking back on my own childhood and my own teenage years, that's how it always worked then, too. This is what you'll get, a reward, as long as you don't do or do these things. A warning. It's really how, how everything in this world works. It's a, it's a reward and a warning. And so children at home, they do their chores and they get the, an allowance. Or not. And so teenagers obey the, the rules of the house and so then they get to go and do fun things with their friends. Or not. And adults, uh, we work at our jobs, we work hard and we get a paycheck, maybe even a bonus. Or we don't. And people everywhere uh, obeying the laws of the land and therefore enjoying the freedoms that we have or not. It is all rewards and warnings, and that's how everything works. And so Jesus, here, in the last book of the Bible, the very last words of the Bible, he talks about a reward and a warning. See, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me. And then at the end of the text, I warn everyone who hears the words of this prophecy. And now we, we could understand Jesus' reward and his warning, just like we understand every reward and warning in this world, as if they work that way. But I promise you we come to a very terrible conclusion. Jesus isn't talking about anything in this world. In fact, he's talking about the end of this world. He's talking when all of it, including how rewards and warnings work, when all of it comes to an end. Jesus is showing us that vision of the end. For this last judgment Sunday, and so we want to know just exactly how he teaches us to know these things, rewards and warnings, now, before the end. What is the reward that Jesus is talking about? And what is the warning? What do they mean to us as believers in Christ? Revelation chapter 22. This is the Apostle John, abandoned, alone in his old age, left for dead on the island of Patmos. And it's Jesus who appears to him finally at the end of his life to comfort him, to give him this vision of all things, this vision of the end, the book of Revelation. 
And while throughout the majority of this book, it's John who's speaking, John who's recounting all the things the Lord showed him, uh, and all the things he heard and he saw for us to, to see with him. Most of the time, it's John speaking with here in this chapter. We get to hear the voice of our Savior again. And it's really a special thing because this is not Jesus uh, as he walked and talked on the earth with his disciples. This is not Jesus who was rejected by the chief priests and teachers of the law. Jesus who was arrested and beaten and crucified. This is Jesus in his eternal heavenly glory. Exalted to the right hand of God who is speaking. The first thing he says in our text is, look, I am soon. And just start with what that would have meant to John. Alone and abandoned in his old age, all the other 11 apostles have been killed by this point, and countless others of his uh, close friends throughout the church as he's traveled. Just think of John hearing those words from Jesus in tremendous comfort and saying, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And the Christian church then, ever since, uh, for the last 2,000 years, and everything that the church has endured during that time, how many believers have heard these very words of comfort and said, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And then you and me, here today, hearing this promise, these words of comfort, and saying the exact same thing. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, sweet. To John, to the church, to each of us. What a tremendous promise that is. It, it's hard for us to understand that word soon, because whatever it is that we're enduring at the moment, it seems like it just won't end. But look at that last word, the word soon. Jesus is inviting you to compare whatever time you have in the, in the things that we endure in this life, to compare it to the eternity that is to come to see this moment as nothing more than soon. Soon, he says. It's hard for us to understand, but perhaps even more difficult to understand is what he says next. He says, My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. And it's words like that that make our Lutheran ears sort of perk up. Wait a second now. How, how does this work again? The reward is based on what we have done. I thought it was just the opposite of that. I thought the, the, the hallmark of God's uh, the gospel is that it's by grace alone, through faith alone, not by our works. What does this mean? What is the reward that he's speaking of? This isn't the only time God's word speaks like this. In fact, consistently throughout his word, he speaks just like this about a reward. The prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 40, See, the sovereign Lord will come to us with power. He will rule with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him. The apostle Paul spoke just like this when he was talking to the Corinthians. He was talking to them about how they build upon the foundation of their faith, how they build on it wisely and carefully. And he says, if what has been built survives, the builder will receive in fact, Jesus speaks exactly this way about himself. In Matthew 16, Jesus said, The Son of Man is going to return in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. It isn't as if at the end of God's word in Revelation 22 that it somehow flips the script on us. God's word consistently speaks this way to us numerous times. And it's exactly what we need to hear. You see, our sinful nature acts like a pendulum back and forth it swings. It loves to take God's word and swing to the complete opposite side. And so we hear God's word tell us that he forgives us. We hear him say that he will always forgive us unconditionally all the time. And our sinful nature takes that and it swings to the opposite side and says, well, therefore, it, it doesn't matter what I do. The good that I could do, 
the good that glorifies him and the good that serves and benefits others, I don't have to do. I'm already loved and forgiven, right? Isn't that exactly what Jesus is warning against? He says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of the scroll, if anyone takes words away from the prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life in the Holy City. See, God's word speaks about the rewards of our faith, the rewards of the fruit of our faith, according to what we have done. Because the sinful nature in us doesn't want to do anything. Needs to be crushed. And so God's word repeatedly talks about our faith and the fruits of our faith being absolutely connected, just like a vine and its branches. And what a great warning that is for us to hear, to warn us against ignoring that fact, to warn us against subtracting it right out of God's word. But unfortunately, that pendulum of the sinful nature isn't finished yet. And now it hears words about rewards. Now it hears uh, about rewards for the things we have done, and again, it swings to the complete opposite side, and on this side, it's perhaps even worse. Over here, it thinks then that God must only love me because of the things that I do, or that God could never love me because of the things I've already done. And isn't that exactly what Jesus warns against? I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of the scroll, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in it. Adding our works, whatever they are, to Christ's work of salvation accomplishes nothing except worshiping ourselves instead of Him. And adding our sins to it in the sense that they're too much for God, more than God could ever forgive, only accomplishes the same thing. That sinful nature and that pendulum need to be crushed. Whether adding or subtracting. Whether thinking that rewards and warnings work the way they work in this world, um, they only lead us away from the truth. Swinging to either side. And what's the unfortunate result of that? Is that the day of God's judgment becomes only something terrifying to us. But it's our Savior who holds out the opposite for us. You see, Jesus, the reward that he has for us, the reward is his. The reward is everything He accomplished for us. In fact, we can say it even better. The reward is Him. The reward He has for us is exactly who He is. And He tells us here, He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. What a reward that is. Jesus, our unchanging God, unmoved by anything from beginning to end, and faithful in His promise to redeem us and forgive us. You see, it's a reward that doesn't work like any reward in this world. Jesus, who earned it all, gives it to us by faith, gives Himself to us by faith. And so that all the things that we do by faith, to His glory and for the benefit and help of each other, no matter how miserably we fail in doing so, time and time again, and yet His reward is the same. It is always undeserved. It is always unearned by us. It is always given freely and fully to us. And how can that be? Well, it's because the warning is also his. What happened on the cross is that God added to Jesus the plagues of all sin, as we're told in this text from Revelation. God added to Jesus the total sin of all people of all time. Jesus was at zero, and then God put him at the maximum number. 
that our sins would be paid for. That we would instead of being cast out of the kingdom of heaven be brought into it by the blood of His Son. And we're told, blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. The reward and the warning. Don't work at all like they do in this life. God has given to us freely. God has taken from us fully all of our sins. Have you ever met a celebrity? Have you ever met a, a famous person, somebody maybe special to you, maybe it's your favorite author or a, a movie star, or it's a, an athlete or a, or a musician, somebody you just love to meet. It's a really exciting moment when you finally do get the chance to meet them. Maybe you had to wait in line outside, you had to wait and wait before you could finally go in, maybe get an autograph or maybe even get to talk to them. And what is going through your mind in whatever amount of time leads up to that, whether it's a day or whether it's just hours, what is running through your mind? What am I going to say? What am I going to say to this person? And you start wrapping your brain of everything that you know about them because you don't want to get it wrong. How embarrassing would it be if you started to talk to that celebrity about them and they say, whoa, 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 I think you, you must be thinking of somebody else. That's not me. What else is God's Word? What else is God's Word of all that it is and it's so many beautiful things? The very light of this world, the very bread of life is God's Word. Of all the things that it is, isn't it also preparing us to meet Him? God Himself prepares us to meet Him, to know everything about Him, who He is and what He has done for us, that we would be prepared to stand before Him. And this particular day, this particular Sunday in the church here, Last Judgment Sunday, and in this vision of the end that Revelation gives us, God is very clearly placing it upon your heart and mine today to think about that, to think about it deeply. You are going to meet Him, and you have been prepared. Daniel, we just heard, gives us a vision of God sitting down and opening up the book of life. Jesus talked about those women waiting through the night for the groom to arrive, some prepared, some not. And then Jesus here teaches us what rewards and warnings mean to his people, to you and to me. We get to add them to our Christian life. Add that reward to your joy. Jesus has a reward for me. Add it to your joy in serving each other and praising Him. Subtract from it whatever uh, foolishness of, of adding to your salvation is already complete. Subtract from it that, that we should be receiving rewards from people in this life. No, the reward is Him. Add it to your joy. And do the same with the warning. Add it to your joy in your handling of His Word. How much of God's Word do we want in our lives? All of it. Not a word more. Not a word less. In all these ways, He has prepared us to meet Him. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. And we say, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. How does it end? That's how. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. You may be seated uh, at this time. We sing a, a hymn, uh, two verses of a hymn that, that praise God for His.
Revelation through the Cosmic Chapter. Heavenly Father, we eagerly await for Jesus to come again and make all things new. May he find us, whose names are written in the book of life, faithfully enduring to the end, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Come, Lord Jesus, may your grace be with us always. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn uh, this morning. Again, uh, uh, speaking about all the things that we've heard in worship today, we sing, uh, it was like two verses of the day is surely drawing near.